Today is August 16th. The court sitting in Summit County will be hearing live arguments today. Uh, judge, the panel, of course, is Judge Hensel on my right, Judge Sutton on my left. I'll be presiding, Judge Theodosio, and I'll be keeping track of time for you all. The first case that we have scheduled for oral argument is Roger Carter versus University Park Development at All. Uh, I noticed the appellee has two attorneys. Howard, you all have 15 minutes, but you'll have to divide that up. Have you talked about how you want to do that? We have, Your Honor. And how would you like to split your time? Uh, I'll be taking uh, 12 minutes. Uh, Marcus Wainwright on behalf of uh, UPA, or excuse me, University Park uh, Development Corporation. Okay. And I believe uh, co counsel will be at the, the remaining three minutes. Very good. All right, as I said, both of you will have 15 minutes to uh, present your arguments. Uh, you may have up to five minutes for rebuttal, attorney uh, Booth, and just let me know and I'll keep track of that time. It's also up on the, on the screen. Uh, the arguments are uh, recorded and presented on our YouTube channel, so we ask that you stay at the podium and keep your voice up so we have a good re recording for the public. And we have read the briefs and we are prepared to proceed if you want. Please, the court. Good morning. My name is Bradley Leboeuf. I am one of the attorneys for the appellant, Roger W. Carter. I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal. Very good. This case started with 18 defendants and 11 counts in Mr. Carter's complaint. By the time we got to trial in, in May of last year, there was only one count remaining in our complaint. That was the breach of contract count and one party defendant remained in the case. That was University Park Development Corporation, also doing business as University Park Alliance, or UPA for short. UPA has served in at least a dozen roles during the course of this litigation. They've been a defendant, co-defendant, partner, Mr. Carter, member of the University Park Village, LLC, the majority member of the University Park Village, the managing member, tax matters member, manager of University Park Village, the grantor, grantee, the debtor, appellee, and co-appellee. Our first assignment of error is the denial of Mr. Carter's summary judgment motion requiring payment of the capital contribution balance be paid. The University Park Village operating agreement stated that UPA was to pay $2.85 million as its initial capital contribution to the LLC. The operating agreement stated that Mr. Carter's capital contribution was $150,000. That operating agreement was signed in January of 2012. In February of 2015, Mr. Carter finally received the, the, the long sought after tax returns of University of Park Village. The Schedule K-1 tax return for 2012 showed UPA's capital contribution is $83,705. Not the $2,850,000 as stated in the operating agreement. That same tax return, the Schedule K-1 in 2012, showed Mr. Carter's capital contributions having been paid in the non-150,000 dollars. That was the exact amount that was stated in the operating agreement. Would the K-1 show any uh, non-cash contributions, goodwill, etc.? Those numbers um, should have been um, put in there. Uh, I don't believe it's required that it be designated specifically as intangibles in or, or, or goodwill. Um, that ties in with our Fourth assignment of error dealing with uh, our expert witness, Russ Phillips, um, who we requested to uh, testify at, at trial regarding the intangible valuations put on the uh, capital contribution by. Uh, and that testimony was not allowed. That testimony was right, not allowed, correct. The motions in Lumine were granted, that were filed by uh, UPA, University Park Village barring Mr. Phillips from, from testifying. He, he was our expert witness and, and, and the CPA. He was expected to testify and to uh, 
about numerous aspects of the, of the tax returns, including the uh, failure on the schedule a K-1 to uh, have a uh, capital contribution value of that to $2.85 million. The, the capital contribution was $83,705. Counsel, it's my understanding from the judgment entry that that testimony was disallowed on the sole basis that his testimony would have been based on another expert's testimony. Am I correct? Am I reading the court's entry correct that that's the reason why Mr. Phillips was not prepared to testify? That's my, my uh, understanding. However, that wasn't the only issue that Mr. Phillips was expected to testify about. He had two expert reports that we also uh, proffered in, into evidence that we uh, talk about the capital contributions and, and the evaluations of the intangibles that were uh, not, not reported uh, on the Schedule K-1. Now, University Park Village, nor UPA, or any of the other defenses cited any tax returns, audited financial statements, or failed market valuations supporting the defendant's representation at the $2.85 million has been, been, been paid. There's no question of material fact that the $2,850,000 has not been paid in full. Our well, second... Just, just real quick there, I know you've been left to argue, but how do we handle uh, Exhibit A in the case? I'm, I'm sorry? Wasn't Exhibit A the operating agreement and there was something in the operating agreement that indicated that uh, they had made capital contributions of, of the full amount. That, that, that's right. That was Schedule A in, in the operating agreement that, that stated that. That's the only place you'll find that $2.85 million number. Um, well, did you agree that they had made that or, or they were going to make that? Yeah, yes. Well, the operating states that, that, that has, it was, it has been contributed. Just like Mr. Carter's uh, capital contribution, which is a, a, actually not in the form of cash, it was a, a two lots of land that he owns that he conveyed to University Park Village for the purpose of the development project on Brown Street near the University of Akron campus. However, that that Schedule A, which says that EPA contributed two million and fifty thousand dollars, it's it, uh, Illusory. The, the tax returns only show eighty-three thousand seven hundred five dollars. That was the basis for our, our count ten of our complaint: the statutory specific performance requiring that deficiency of the capital contribution to be paid in, in, in cash. Okay, thanks. I'll let you continue. The second assignment of error dealt with the granting of motion of summary judgment dismissing Carter's members' derivative action. The, the trial court misinterpreted the operating agreement. The, the trial court said that the UPD operating agreement clearly indicates that the management of University Park Village is reserved to its members. University, University Park Village, or UPD for short, is not member managed. It's managed by a manager. The operating agreement states that each managing member shall be deemed a manager. That's in line with revised code 1705.25C, it states that the manager, or a person who is both a manager and a member has the rights and powers of a manager. The Lumen Liability Act was repealed, chapter 1705 was repealed and there's been a whole new statutory scheme implemented in February of this year, Chapter 1706. And it's interesting that, that under the, the new statute, 1706.61, there's no distinction between a member-managed or a manager-managed LLC. And it, the legislature has actually made it easier for a, a member, an oppressed member of a limited liability company to bring a derivative action. The court was wrong in that in determining that UPV was not managed by a manager, it was management was restricted to a manager. That was the UPA. The court had a second basis for denying Carter's derivative claim, and, and the court stated that there was no question of material fact that Mr. Carter lacked standing to bring a derivative action. It's our contention that he did have standing. He said Mr. Carter satisfied the 
Revised Code 1705.50, which requires that a plaintiff must be a member at the time of bringing the action, which he was back in 2013, the original lawsuit, and then in 2015, he was still a member of the LLC. That statute also requires that a plaintiff must be a member at the time of which he complains. That goes back to January of 2012 when the operating agreement was signed, where UPA says that they contributed a $2.85 million capital contribution. When the tax returns show otherwise, it's $83,705. To bring a derivative action, the complaint must also set forth with particularity the efforts to secure commencement of the action by the manager, and that was done in our complaint, as well as Exhibit 37 to our complaint. There's no question of material fact that Mr. Carter has satisfied the derivative action requirements in the Revised Code 1705.49, 1705.50, and 1705.51. A third assignment of error... You're at 525. I'll let you know right now, so you can continue, obviously. A third assignment of error dealt with Mr. Carter's denial of any discovery at the trial court level. Mr. Carter has statutory and contractual rights to the financial information of the operation of University Park Village. The court went less to any discovery, complete any discovery of the case. The court also erred in denial of our motion to compel discovery from the subpoena that was taken that was issued to the accountant, the accounting firm that prepared the tax return, that it was reported that University Park Village was a disregarded entity. There were two tax returns, actually, that were filed, the IRS Form 990, that said University Park Village was a single-member LLC, when it actually was a two-member LLC, UPA and Mr. Carter. The court said we should file the motion to compel to get those documents from the accounting firm that we should have instead filed a motion to show cause. There's no requirement under civil rule of that requirement. I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. All right, thank you. As you see, what is that, four minutes and seven seconds. Attorney Wainwright, I think you said you wanted 12, right? That is correct, Your Honor. All right. Are you going to proceed? Yep. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to please the court. I am Marcus Wainwright, here on behalf of the Appalese University Park Public Corporation, as well as the individual defendants named in this matter, namely Anthony O'Leary, Brett Trier, John Fowlertalk, and Eric Johnson. And before I address counsel's legal arguments, I think there's a little bit of important background that we just need to distinguish, especially when it comes to assignment of error number three regarding the discovery. As Mr. Carter's counsel has indicated, that this case has been pending since 2013. You know, we filed motions to dismiss, you know, various dispositive motions. They were granted leave to amend their complaint. But the court ultimately decided that all of the tort claims were dismissed against UPA, as well as dismissing all of the individual defendants in that initial prior action. So I think that's important. And it's also important that substantial discovery was completed in that initial 2013 matter. The matter wasn't dismissed until 2015. So that initial matter, thousands of documents were exchanged in discovery. There was several subpoenas issued to non-parties, and several depositions were taken. So, you know, just linking that to Carter's assignment of error number three, he can't support the fact that no discovery took place in this matter. Just quickly, though, didn't he add claims in the subsequent filings? I believe it was the specific performance claim was added, as well as, I think, the rescission, if I'm not mistaken, Your Honor. And again, those are remedies, not actual causes of action. So I think, you know, the assertion that no discovery took place is just not accurate. And, you know, to go along with that assignment of error number three, 
I think the, the court needs to also uh, keep in mind that, um, you know, as far as the uh, subpoena dues is taken to the Stennett accounting firm, Carter was able to call those individuals at trial. At trial. They testified and they confirmed that the only thing that they prepared was the Federal Form 990 for the tax year of 2012, which he was complaining about. Um, he prepared no other financial statements, and it, I believe there was no other financial, financial statements of UPA or UPB. So again, you know, uh, and I believe Carter even had the Form 990 when he actually referenced it, referenced it in his complaint. So therefore, any error of, of potential error which was harmless, you know. So again, he did get the opportunity to, to question those individuals and um, that they were called at trial. And uh, going back to assignment of error number one regarding the specific performance, uh, regarding the requirement of the payment of the capital contribution, counsel today just admitted that the operating agreement stated that the parties had agreed this is what the parties contributed. And that's what's stated in the Schedule A, it says capital and other contributions. So therefore, the fact that there was no requirement that the $2.85 million be in, in, in cash, um, you know, the parties agreed that UPA did make this $2.58 million in, co in capital contribution. It did require cash, and revised code 1705.09, it, it gives the uh, members of an LLC to make a, a wide range of forms of contribution, intangible versus tangible. And so, you know, again, you know, the things that the intangibles that UPA brought to the table they, the UPA board, goodwill, reputation, experience. They had a partnership with KUD International, uh, who was the master development partner to assist uh, with the planning, pre-development project manager, um, pre-planning pre -planning and development services, uh, market surveys, rendering, schematics, surveys. Again, those were all things that Carter could not provide, and we they agreed this was the value of what UPA is going to Contribute on that schedule. A. Was the uh, did the operating agreement define capital contribution or did it reference was it just a reference to the exhibit or was there an actual definition in the yeah, there was no definition in the actual operating agreement but it does refer to the schedule A like I said it's labeled capital and other contributions clearly at the top of that schedule A and I don't believe there's any. Uh, statute that requires any capital co capital contribution to be in, in, in all cash. You know, again, you know, referring back to 1705.09. And to address um, Mr. Carter's point regarding the, the tax returns, he is, that is accurate. It did show the cash contribution that was made by uh, UPA, but again. There's no requirement. There's no requirement that the uh, intangibles be shown on that tax return. So again, you know, the part the operating agreement is the instrument that recorded the party's agreement on the value of what they contributed. They said they had contributed, not they will. Uh, you know, it has to be all cash. You know, again, it, it, it stated this is what the parties had contributed. Carter signed off on it. UPA signed off on it. You know, in the, in the creation of uh, this UPB. Entity. And you know, Carter should not be able to rewrite that uh, agreement now and, and try to restrict UPA's contribution to modify what they were what they were required to contribute when they had a firm agreement on what those contributions are. Regarding um, Carter's assignment error at number two, the, the, the trial court got it right. Um, you know the. The, the gatekeeper statute is 1705.49. If you don't meet that requirement under 1705.49, you don't get to 17.50. It, it is, is our contention. And 1705.49 prohibits a member from commencing a derivative action when the LLC is member managed. Now, when you look at the operating agreement, I believe it's Article 1 that describes that um, the de in the definition section that this is a uh, that UPA will be member managed. And so I think if you look at the uh, leading authority on this, I believe it's O'Neill and Thompson's, which is a treatise, 
Um, it basically states that revised code 1705.282 allow the LLC to appoint a member to serve as the manager. The operating agreement can grant managerial power to one member in a member managed LLC. And that's exactly what happened here. You know, UPA, this UPB operating agreement, that's exactly what it did. So, you know, uh, the operating agreement didn't appoint a third party manager, it, it was UPA, and they served in that function. And so, you know, again, I don't think uh, the, the court was wrong in their decision where they stated that Carter had not just managed to bring this derivative action claim. As far as assignment of error number four regarding uh, the testimony of uh, Russell Phillips, um, the trial court um, was correct in that uh, if you look at both of uh, the that expert's reports, he based his testimony solely on the report of, I believe, John Emick is, is his name. And so, you know, the court did not err in, in restricting or precluding that, that expert from, from testifying. Now, regarding the, uh, the uh, intangibles that should have been on the tax return or so on and so forth, I believe in the proffer uh, at the trial level, I believe the court indicated that uh, that testimony was going to be precluded because it, it brings in those quote unquote misrepresentations toward fraud and breach of fiduciary duty, which had already been excluded in the motion to dismiss. So, again, I believe read the court's entire opinion regarding that, I believe the court viewed it as an end round to try to get those claims and get those type of issues back in front of the jury, which the court clearly had ruled was not appropriate. And again, they just weren't relevant to the breach of contract claim, the single claim that was remaining at the time of the trial. In regards to Carter's fifth assignment of error, and <laughs> that includes counts two, three, four, five, six against the individual defendants, and six, eight, nine, and ten regarding UPA, or actually all defendants, excuse me. And I think the best way to, to handle that assignment of error is one, you know, I guess probably to handle the individual defendants first. There's no allegation that in the complaint that any individual did anything in their personal capacity. They didn't sign any documents in their personal capacity. They did not achieve any personal benefit. They did not commit any individual wrongdoing or did not do anything other than in their corporate capacity as a board member of UPA. Um, so again, the individuals were directors of UPA. They were never um, directors of UPB or a board of uh, member of the board of UPB. Again, so, you know, just regarding those individual claims, those individual tort claims, regarding the uh, individual defendants, the court was absolutely correct in just, just dismissing those in the, in the uh, 12B phase of, of this matter. In regards to uh, UPA, uh, regarding count two, that breach of fiduciary duty, I think the court actually uh, their analysis was spot on, and that you know while UPA may have owed fiduciary duties to Carter as a member of UPA, the allegations of the complaint did not show any breach of the fiduciary duty that resulted in any damages separate and apart from damages claimed in the breach of contract claim. Again, this court has routinely uh, dismissed the, these type of uh, actions. Um, in, in the motion to dismiss phase and under 12B6 phase. And the case that comes to mind is that 22 Exchange LLC versus Exchange Association LLC, where it was very, very simple facts, very similar to this instance. And, um, you know, the court here ruled that it, it, it can't be decided on the 12B, uh, at the 12B stage of, of the case. And, Your Honor, it looks like I'm out of time. I'll let. Mr. Grant. Senator Grant, you will have three minutes and 23 seconds. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. My name is Andrew Grant on behalf of the other appellee in this matter, University Park Village LLC. I am a law firm, Board of State of Seymour and Pete. 
Honors, I know we have very little time. There's a lot of issues going on in this case. Uh, so really, I'd like to address one assignment of errors, which is assignment of error number six, as that's the only one uh, directly um, addressed to UPV. Assignment of error six seeks reversal of two orders in favor of UPV. Uh, the April 27, 2021, partial motion for summary judgment, and that was on counts five, seven, and eight. Uh, and the May 13th, 2021, um, order dismissing counts two, three, and four of the complaint, and that was on a motion for, uh, motion for judgment on pleading standard. Uh, the trial court's decision should be affirmed on both, for obviously the reasons um, being discussed today, um, uh, as well as within the briefs, and then specifically, I'd like to address the May 13th, 2021, order, which it appears that uh, appellant is disputing or, or arguing specifically as to more of a procedural timing matter of the filing of the motion. Again, going back to the to the filings of the motions, initially on April 27, 2021, when the uh, trial court granted in part the motion for summary judgment that UPV had pending, it also denied in part uh, motion for summary judgment on counts two, three, and four. Um, two days after that uh, decision, UPV filed its motion for reconsideration of the motion for summary judgment, and then on the alternative, a motion for judgment on the pleadings. Uh, it, two days is, is, is as quick as I think uh, counsel can be expected to turn around a motion for reconsideration, um, and it's also it was sufficient time that actually appellant was able to oppose um, and that the trial uh, was not delayed. Um, that's the thing. Specifically important as to the motion for judgment on the pleadings, where the civil rules permit a motion for judgment on the pleadings uh, after the pleadings are closed, but within such a time as not to delay trial, um, any party may move for judgment on the pleadings. And uh, this court, specifically in Smith v. Nagel, has found that within the court's discretion to permit the filing of a 12C motion, even on the day of a jury trial, again, provided that the trial was not delayed. Um, Briefly, I'd also like to address, because I have a minute, um, literally, uh, assignment of error three, uh, specifically looking at that um, for UPV, it was on the uh, discovery issues for, or surrounding the 56F motion that appellant filed on um, the motion, um, when we filed the motions for summary judgment, it was, I believe, at that time, cross motions for summary judgment. Uh, and at that time, uh, there had been the prior discovery that happened in the case, as Mr. Wayne had already referred to. But I'd also like to address, I, I do understand that additional claims were filed. Um, however, all those claims are on the same exact oper operative facts in this case and the discovery that occurred in the prior proceedings. I, I don't think anyone would dispute that these facts have not changed over the past going on nine years um, that have occurred. So the fact that the additional claims were um, provided does not change the discovery that was previously provided. And on that, Your Honors, I again uh, request this court affirm the trial court's decision. Thank you. All right, thank you, Attorney Brown. Attorney LeBuff, you've got four minutes and seven seconds for your reply. Equity, divorce, or forfeiture. The appellees uh, distorted in the briefs the, the, the facts that they claim that. Mr. Carter is no longer a member of the University Park Village. So there's been no mention in the trial transcript that Mr. Carter has lost his, his membership interest. Uh, co appellee uh, Jay Brett Tyler, our director in the University Park Alliance, testified at trial that Mr. Carter would lose his membership interest if he elected that project delay payment that's mentioned in the operating agreement and received the, the $268,705. He never received that, that, that money. And until you receive that money, he remains a member of the LLC. There's been no tax returns. There's no company records that say Mr. Carter is no longer a member of the University Park Village. Now, police also twist the facts, distort the facts that Mr. Carter's, uh, the party's capital contribution to an LLC can only be made in cash. Carter's never, never claimed that. In fact, Mr. Carter's capital contribution was land. It wasn't in the form of cash. UPA's capital contribution was uh, supposed to be $2,850,000 when, when that money was not reported on, on the tax returns. That's when Carter requested that the uh, capital contribution be, be paid in cash. That was under 1705.09 of, of the 
revised code. The, that balance of the, of the capital contribution and deficiency of over $2 million, that's what was supposed to be paid in cash, not the initial contribution. We never maintained that. We request that the trial court's decision to dismiss the individual defendants, Johnson, Valtok, Trier, and Leary be reversed. We also request that the trial court's dismissal of counts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 be reversed. The appellant requests that the trial court's orders grant and summary judgment to University Park Alliance and University Park Village on count 11 be reversed. Mr. Carter is entitled to judgment as a matter of law on counts 10 and 11 regarding interpretation of the operating agreement in Chapter 1705. And actually, counts 10 and 11, the, the statute of specific performance, and, and count 10 and count 11, the derivative action plan, those are our two new, new counts that were in the refiled case in 2015. Dismissal of University Park Village as, as a party was, was an improper University Park Village was a necessary, indispensable party. They stood to benefit from the capital contribution infusion. University Park Village uh, holds record title to the property that Mr. Carter contributed to, to the LLC. The payment of the project, the bank payment, uh, was stated in the operating agreement. That was an obligation of University Park Village, not UPA. Now, I also request that the trial court's orders barring the discovery uh, be reversed and that on remand, the subpoenas previously issued to the council be obeyed. We disagree with UPA's council in their statement today that discovery was completed in the in the prior action of the 2013 case. There were numerous uh, requests for protective order, restrictions on the scope of our subpoenas that were, that were issued. We couldn't even depose any of the accountants in, in this case. And that was a, a crucial factor in trying to get to the, to the bottom of the financial information in this matter. We also request that the jury verdict be reversed as there was error in the jury's instructions on the affirmative defense of prevention of performance. Mr. Carter requests that this matter be remanded to the trial court for further proceedings consistent with his opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Bob. All right, the court will take this stand on the advice and the decision and due course on the day of the decision is rendered and each received a copy of it. And you can also uh, keep an eye out on the Ohio Supreme Court's website where the opinions are posted. Uh, on behalf of Judge Schensel and Judge Sutton, we want to thank you for coming down and arguing. I mean, the briefs were well written, but it's always nice to hear the arguments as well. Um, so have a good day.